James 3. So if you'll turn there with me. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole flock in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest fire is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a whole world of evil among parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is, is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and cre- creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men, we who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. <clears throat> My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow over the same spring? My brothers, can a fig, bear, fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility by, that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and spiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition... There you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Our second scripture passage is Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Do we have children's church? No children's church. Can you hear me? Am I on? Good? Okay. So I didn't even see Sherry's lips move, but did you hear her repeat that echo that time? That's how I feel when I'm at home. And she says, Alan, because I hear Alan, Alan. (laughs) That was kind of neat. I don't know how she did it, but she did it. Let's start in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your church, for all that have come to to be here, Father, to partake in worship. Lord, it's just undescribable how good you are. And the words that you have for wisdom for us, for teachings... Help us to hear those words today and help us to take them to heart that we may be the lights that you require for this world. Father, that we will let people know the love that is in us, the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I pray your blessings today upon each and every one here and that your spirit be upon this place today. Teach us and help us to bring the things that we have into reality, Father, so that we can bless you further. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the tongue, very small object, it's not hard at all, kind of thought, but boy, can it take a beating, can it not, if it gives one out. There's no bones in it or anything, but it could probably hurt you worse than if I took my leg bone and started smacking you with it. That's the power of the tongue. And that's what James is saying here in the, in the scripture that we read. I entitled this message, Loose Lips Sink Ships. Are you familiar with what that saying means and where it derived from? It was a saying that came about in World War II because loose or idle chatter might literally sink ships because you might be passing on some information, some intel that the enemy might find out about you 
and then find out our course of, of action. And if we lose a ship, we could lose a war. We'll definitely have loss of life. There are all kind of repercussions of that. So that's why I chose that as a title today. Um, it's very, very serious. Our tongue, we don't realize it. And it's amazing that we tend to lash out the most on the ones that we love the most. But our tongue can have drastic, drastic impact on others. And they can be lasting impacts that can last for years and years and years. When you just out of one minute of stupidity and rage yelled out, I hate you to someone that you love or something like that. So remember that. And we're going to go through James today. I've got some images to show you of loose lips sink ships. Maybe some of you have seen some of these before. That's the one that they used in the war campaigns the most with a battleship going down, loose lips sink ships. Go ahead, Logan. That one, if you can see it, is a warning sign. And it says, The sharp ears of enemy agents are always listening for scraps of information. Don't let your careless talk help the enemy. And then it tells you things to do not discuss and goes on to say, Be on your guard. So it doesn't take a lot of information. Sometimes just that little bitty tidbit of information may be enough that it really hurts someone else. It hurts them, you know, hurts their life. The next image is the enemy is listening. He wants to know what you know, so keep it to yourself. And I like the last one the best because you've got a fish. And it says, even a fish would not be caught if it kept its mouth shut. (laughs) So your words can catch you. Yesterday, I didn't do very good catching fish. I caught a couple, but we went um, down the Kootenai River and we brought back a nice mess of fish. So if you want to come over for dinner, just tell me and we'll cook some. Rainbow trout, they're very nice. But I guess for me, they kept their mouth shut because I caught one. But we've got about seven or eight to eat thanks to the good fisherman that was with us. We had a great day. We live in a world that loves gossip. So don't forget that. That doesn't mean it's okay. Just because you live in a part of something doesn't mean that you don't need to be set apart from it. It doesn't mean that you pull yourself away and you have no part of it whatsoever because God still requires you to be a light. He requires you to be the hands and feet to this world. So you have to be part of it, but you don't have to participate in gossip. Just go to any grocery store or the Walmart checkouts, and what do you see at the, at the teller lines? You see all these magazines, maybe not as prevalent in some forms as we used to because some of them kind of went by the way. Some of the examiners and stars, they may be out there. I don't see them as much. But they have juicy tidbits of gossip. You see, this person did this, or this person did that. And even if you're not into gossip, you can't help but look and say, Oh, I didn't know that that person cheated on that person. And then what are you going to do with that information? Satan, as we learned earlier, is the main adversary of conflict in the story, in God's story. And he wants to deceive you, just like he did with Eve in the garden. He didn't come up to her and say, Disobey God. He said, is that what God really said? So when you look at those magazines, or you participate in that gossip down in the workplace or wherever, is that something you should be doing? Is it godly? Is it upright? And there's a fine line there. Because you can be deceived so easily by Satan, so many ways, that you think something is so... so nonchalant, it doesn't matter, but it could have such severe consequences. And when you realize it, you know, it's usually too late when you realize it. I've got some tabloid headlines too, and you can see if you can even believe that people would read this. The first one there, it says, Half man, half dog, baffles doctors. That's a, this is a legitimate headline. What's the next one? Oh, this one's great. Bigfoot kept Lumberjack as a love slave. And then if you can read inside, it says, Outraged wife. He's no longer the man I married. Well, I wouldn't think so. What's the next one? Titanic survivors found aboard. That one's believable, isn't it? And I like this last one the best. It's Oprah Winfrey. Alien Bible found and they worshipped Oprah. Now, that one might be a little bit believable compared to the other ones, but this is some of the outlandish headlines we, we read. Now, we don't believe those kind of things. 
But when you talk about your neighbor down the road to your friend and you say, did you hear that such and such? Did you know that? Let me tell you the rest of the story. Where are your words leading? Are they edifying? Are they building up? Are they causing chaos? Would you want the things to be said about you? Satan wants to deceive us. He wants us, especially as Christians, to be not a light. He wants our light to shine dimly or not shine at all. And that's one major way that, that Satan is going to get us if we don't watch it. He is a deceiver. As Job said, he is constantly going to and from the earth, seeing what havoc he can reap, seeing what he can do. I don't know about you, but I've done plenty of things, said plenty of things that I wish I could take back. Problem is, once you've said those words, done those things, the damage is done, isn't it? You can go say you're sorry. They may accept your apology. You may go on with your life like that, but there's still damage and hurt and scars. And scars can build character. But we need to be very careful because of the words that we say and what actions that, that, that could result. And we live in a culture, like I said, that thrives on that. So don't be mistaken, don't be fooled by it. The reason I say that is that so much this week, I was going to preach on something differently. But if you look on Facebook, because we live in a multimedia world now, you can get your information just at the click of a button. You don't have to leave your home. You don't have to go down to the local barber shop to have your gossip. That used to be the hangout place years ago, right? You'd find out whatever was going on in town from the local barber. He was the gossip master. Now, all you've got to do is look on your computer, or better yet, just start answering your texts and stuff, because they're right there. Did you know? Did you hear? And I say that this week because we had an accident involved, and it involves a preacher in this community, Garrett. And I'm not pointing any fingers, and if I'm starting to gossip, you can point all your fingers at me. We don't need to gossip about anything like that. This is a situation that Satan would love to use to distract us from what our purpose is. And our purpose is to be a light and bring others that don't know the light to the salvation, reconciliation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So be very careful when you're saying things and doing things that it is building up and edifying to God and His children, not tearing them down. And all over the internet, on Facebook and everywhere I saw, did you know this? Did you know that? Guess what? None of you knew anything that were, that were being said. And I'm not pointing fingers at you, whoever were, were saying things. And I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. I'm saying be careful. That is something Satan sees and he says, Woo, here I've got a spot that I can get in. I can bury in deep. And before they realize it, just like Solomon, his life was ruined. And he had everything that the world could offer him. God gave him more wisdom than any man ever. And he was a fool. So I say that. So I say let's look at James and see what James says. In James chapter 3, it's called Taming the Tongue. It says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we, we who teach will be judged more strictly. Verse 2, We all stumble in many ways. We all do. So don't think that you've done something wrong and, and Joe over there has not. We all stumble. And guess what? In many ways. Okay? Paul said, why do I do the things that I choose not to do? The man who devoted his life to, to starting Christianity and going to all the different churches. He said, why do I do the things that I do not want to do? We all stumble. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. I think James is just being really silly here, isn't he? He's letting you know that you're not perfect. Okay? If you were, things would be great. We wouldn't need a Savior, would we? But we do. Then he goes on to give examples, and he gives six examples. Verse 3, When we put bits into the mouths of a horse to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal... So, how many of you rode horses? Would you ride a horse without a bit? Some people would if they're that confident. They know their animal that well. But the bit is what controls that animal. This tiny piece of metal that you put in there. 
And if you did it, and you heard somebody pulling on a piece of metal like this, you would do whatever they said as well. So you take a 1,200-pound animal with a 200-pound rider or even smaller, and they can control that animal if they know what they're doing. And that's what James is saying here. That's what your words do. That's what your tongue does for you. It leads you. It guides you. It takes you where the words that you said start you in that direction. Now, at any point you can realize and stop, but your tongue is leading you into a direction, a direction of righteousness or a direction of sin. The next example that it gives, that James gives, is he says, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and they are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Same thing. James says that it steers you. Your speech steers you. Words can build up or destroy, and then they take direction. I don't know if you're familiar with most ships, but take the Titanic, for example. The Titanic was 852 feet long, 92 feet wide, 175 feet tall, and it weighed 52,310 tons. So how big do you think the rudder was? And James is comparing it to the tongue. 15 feet wide at its biggest point. Now, many of you might say, well, the Titanic sank. That's not because of the rudder. It had nothing to do with the rudder. The rudder was more than adequate to steer the ship. The tongue is such a small part of our body, but look at the power that it has. Think about some things in your life or in others' lives where you saw that power and that impact. So it can steer a horse wherever it wants to go. It can steer a ship wherever it wants to go. The next example was that James talks about it being a fire. Let me find my verses here. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Fires are started with a spark. Not with someone out with a flame gun starting a fire, but a small spark. And then you can see what it can turn into. If you're familiar with the um, fire over in Washington, the Carlton Complex fire, that's the biggest fire that's, that Washington has reported in its history. It started with four little small sparks, four independent fires. So you've got four tongues going on here together. Then they united and it grew exponentially. It happened on July 14th and was about 44,000 acres when it first started. Then it jumped from July 14th to July 17th to 215,000 acres. That's how rapidly that it got out of control. So that little statement that you made, that someone else made of gossip, look how rapidly James is comparing that to how rapidly that it can get out of control. And then on July 19th, it was 237,000 acres. So James is comparing it to a fire, a fire that can easily, easily get out of control. So why would you want to play with the fire in the first place? And look at the damage that it caused. This particular fire has caused hundreds of homes to be lost, and it has caused a loss of life as well. That is what James is comparing your tongue to. And with only a spark... The fire like that can get started. The next thing that James compares to is wild animals. Verse 6, verse we'll finish with the tongue. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it it itself set on fire by hell. Remember, that's where sin comes from. That's where our conflict comes from, straight from hell. So if you are not, if your words are not edifying, but your words are gossip and destroying, where are those words coming from? Their origin is in hell. Verse 7 says, All kind of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. If you've ever watched a lion tamer, he comes out with a chair and a whip, and that lion obeys him. Or if you take a massive elephant 
the guy goes out there and controls that elephant. We can tame all kind of massive animals, wild beasts. But James says here that we cannot tame the tongue. What a little member of the body, but what a vital part that it can be in your lives, what direction it can give. It can set your life on fire for God or on fire for Satan. Out of the same mouth, well, verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men. You have been made in God's likeness. So if we're made in God's likeness, why in the world would we want to curse our brother? Jesus Christ died for you. He died for that neighbor down the road that you don't like. He died for your children that you love. He died for each and every one of us. We were made in His image, in His likeness, valuable beyond any belief that He would send His Son to die on the cross for our sins. So how in the world would we want to curse and gossip our brother? Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? So now we have the comparison of a spring. What happens if you go to a well and you drink water and it's unfit to drink? You spit it out, right? So why would you want words that are like that to come out of your mouth? And it says, My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grape vine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So James goes on to give another comparison. A fig tree produces what? Figs. Doesn't produce anything else. It might not produce, it might not be an effective tree, but it never produces some other type of item. It never produces a poisonous fruit. James goes on to say, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. And we talked several weeks about wisdom. Wisdom starts and is the fear of the Lord. So if you're speaking words of wisdom, you're speaking words of righteousness. If you're speaking foolish folly, then you're speaking words that come from the devil that started in hell, as James said. And words that can take various tolls on other people's lives. And you don't even realize it when you're doing it. Verse 14 says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. James repeats himself and where that talk is coming from. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But wisdom that comes from from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That's what our our words should be like. They should be words of love. Words that will draw others to Jesus Christ. In verse 18 it says, Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Throughout the New Testament you'll see that we're compared to harvesters. We're supposed to plant those seeds. We're supposed to speak the talk. We're supposed to live the actions that will glorify our Heavenly Father, that will be a light to men that don't know Him. So if your words are inconsistent with that, how can you be that example? I heard a phrase that said that if you're not part of the solution when you're talking, maybe you shouldn't be talking about it. Words to think about. And I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm not saying this is a gossiping church because this is a very loving church. The reason I'm following up with this is we need to be very aware of what the devil is doing that He does it day in, day out. He's done it for many, many years. He's not going to stop. He's not going to let up. And when He sees a little crack to sneak into, He's just going to be like a mouse. How did a mouse get through this small hole? 
He's going to be in there, nibbling and gnawing, seeing what kind of damage he can do. And James warns us about our tongue. If we're going to be a church that has a direction, that wants to focus on winning others to Jesus Christ, we've got to guard our tongue. Our tongue is compared, again, by James to wild animals that can't be tamed, to a fire that burns out of control with one spark, to... Um, look at my verses. <laughs> Sorry about that. To a bit that guides and steers the horse, to a rudder on a ship that is very tiny, but steers a massive ship. And he compares us to a spring that produces two types of water or a fig tree that produces two types of fruit. He didn't just say, hey, be careful of your tongue. It can be bad. He gave us six examples, and then he told us how to live righteously after that. He let us know that if we don't watch our tongue and guard our tongue, that improper speech is straight from the devil. So I think he's pretty clear. Romans 6, 6 says this, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. I don't know about you, but my tongue is probably one of my worst problems. And it's, like I said, it's so ironic that the times that I say the things that hurt the most, I'm talking to the ones I love the most. And that's so sad. I'm just as guilty. I will point my fingers at myself. James says that it's something that no man can tame. But Romans 6, 6 tells me that I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I don't have to do that. I don't have the power to control my tongue. But through God, I can conquer sin. Proverbs 18.21, Sherry read it earlier, says this, and this is from our wise fool Solomon. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who live it will eat its fruit. So the things you say can build up, draw people to Jesus Christ, to reconciliation to God their Father, or they can tear down. And you can hear statements like, I would have been a Christian. I heard that this week. I would have been a Christian if I didn't know one. Where did that come from? From the things that were said to things they did? So the choice is ours with what we do with our tongue. And Solomon goes on to say, those who love it will eat its fruit. So the things that you say will come back around to you. You will be held accountable for them. You will eat it whether your words are good or honest. How many times have you ever said, boy, I wish I could eat those words? But you can't. Because you've already spewed them out of your mouth. So before you think about, before you say it, think about it. And let's look at the example of David, a man after God's own heart, Solomon's dad. In Psalm 71, 23, and 24, David said this, My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have redeemed. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. For those who want to harm me have been put to shame and confusion. David was an example of someone who did stumble and fall repeatedly. But yet his eyes were focused on God. His heart was focused. He repented when he did fall and God forgave him. That's what we have as a loving God. And God saw his heart and saw that it was focused on him. And these statements say that. Now does that mean... Next day, he didn't say or do something that he shouldn't have done? No. He did many things he shouldn't have done. But his tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. That's where his heart was. That's the way we want to live our lives. So that when people do see us, do see our church, they say, wow, I want to have what they have. I want to know the God that they know. I thought that it wasn't important, but they must know something that I don't know. Because when I look at them, I see something different. I see that light. And I want to know that Jesus. And I don't know about you, but that's the direction I want to head as a church. And I just want us to be aware that Satan is out there 24-7. He wants to destroy us. Destroying the image of our God so that he can be a false God. And I don't want him to do that. 
I want to guard our tongues. So I pray that before you say or do anything, especially when gossip is just all around you, you think about what you're saying. Is it godly? Is it helpful? Would I like for it to be said about me? And how can I be that example? What things can I say to glorify my God in heaven? And if we do that, then guess what? Maybe we will draw others to Jesus Christ. If you'll pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We thank you that your word does give us words of guidance as well as words of warning. Father, help us to take those things to heart. Bless each and every one of your children. Give them the strength that they need through your spirit, Father, that they can do mighty things, not to give them glory or might, but, Father, to show that in their weaknesses you are so great. And, Father, that lives will be changed, lives will be saved, and that we will be your humble and faithful servants. I just thank you for the love that you've given us, especially that you pursued us so much that you shed Jesus' blood on Calvary as our remission of sins. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.